Hi everyone, welcome to the 2024 Talent and Salary Guide for the World of Data Engineering. Uh, my name is Lucas. I am a um, <clears throat> I am a uh, data recruiter within the Understanding Recruitment NFP team, uh, covering the data specialism across the wider public sector. Um, I've been in the public sector recruitment game for about eighteen months now. Um, you know, I've built many a great connection across the wider public sector, from you know NHS, uh, central local government, housing associations, higher education, and kind of everything in between. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of run through the salary uh, salary guide. Uh, massive thank you to the marketing team who helped pull it all together. Um, so I mean. Before we start, it'd be great to know where kind of everyone's kind of watching from, um, kind of, you know, you know, what kind of work you do, um, and it'd be great to kind of, you know, get as many people involved as possible. Um, if there are questions at the end, obviously more than happy to answer any of them for you. Uh, we'll do a little Q&A at the end. That should be all fun and games. Um, so, I mean, more than happy to give it a minute, kind of let people kind of join in. Um, but kind of want to run through just quickly now what we're going to cover across this kind of salary guide uh, and talent report. So we'll run it with a bit of an introduction, kind of what I'm going to be speaking about, uh, you know, ac across the kind of report. Um, kind of show the aims, the key trends, uh, some kind of broader facts around the uh, wild world of data engineering. Uh, some of the benefits that come alongside working within the data engineering space in the public sector. And more importantly, what kind of clients are kind of in, kind of investing big within the world of data engineering, um, kind of which kind of public sector uh, bodies are hiring more than others, um, what reasons particularly that could be, would that be, you know, is, that, is it more for contract work, is it more permanent basis on the BAU side of things? Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's just jump straight into it. So, um, you know, if we go straight into the salary plan and the salary report, um, love to kind of run through the introduction part of that first. So as, as you know, as governments undergo um, massive digital transformations and, and migrate to the cloud, so we're finding that the demand uh, for skilled data engineering, uh, for data engineers has, has significantly increased. Um, so what we're going to try and aim to do here is to, you know, explore that kind of growing role that, you know, data engineers are, are kind of having within not just government organisations, but across the wider public sector, um, with many different projects uh, kind of being taken under at the moment within the public sector. Um, you know, the need for good skilled data engineers ha ha, you know, has never been higher. Um, as you can see by the report here, you know, 57, you know, we've seen an increase of around 57 data engineers uh, last year alone. So, you know, the definite demand is there and, you know, it's a case of which public bodies are doing what, you know, what's the need for these sorts of people and, and how can we best utilise them and what, what makes, you know, working in the public sector so attractive for data engineers. Um, you know, we know that working in the public sector has its own sorts of flaws, <laughs> you know, it's not perfect. Uh, as many of you know, kind of work in the public sector takes a special kind of uh, mentality to get through, whether that be through the bureaucracy, the red tape, uh, the salary, um, it its own sets of challenges that you might just not find in the private sector. And you're know, speaking to a lot of data engineers, and not just engineers, but data professionals across the public sector um, who, you know, come from the private sector, you know, they've all kind of admitted that, you know, it's not as, it was, it's an entirely new world. And so it's very interesting to hear kind of what people think regarding that. Um, you know, if you, have you come from a private sector background, for example, have you kind of recently moved into the public sector or have you been a public sector kind of data professional for your whole career? It'd be great to kind of hear kind of where your backgrounds are from. Um, so carrying on so whilst you know perm roles are still common within the uh you know within the public sector there's been a reliance on contractors over the last kind of 12 18 months kind of short term you know project-based work um you know obviously highlighting that kind of flexibility or the need for it um in, in kind of ever-evolving demands um so look if we kind of kind of move on now to the sort of aims that we're trying to get out of of, of kind of this report and, and a salary uh, salary guide so you know what we're going to be trying to do is provide kind of actionable intelligence to decision makers uh and professionals you know equipping them to, to kind of uh you know, equipping them with the, the tools to navigate this kind of landscape effectively. You'll know, be looking at emerging trends uh, and, you know, in-depth salary insights sourced from, you know, our database and platforms like LinkedIn Insights. Um, but I'd like to kind of cover some of the broader facts, um, as you can see here. Um, you know, at the moment we're looking, at, well, from our sources within LinkedIn, um, you know, 
we've got roughly around 1800 just under 1850 uk data engineers within the public sector um, i know that's correct of around february this year that could have gone up exponentially might not have gone up at all since <laughs> since then it might have even gone down but um you know like we said earlier like i said earlier that you know 57 you know, the person increase already um you know so there's obviously a growing demand uh as as a lot of us already know kind of the tech industry in general is a it's a very dominated by like a male dominated industry um you know whether that kind of stems down from kind of education at an early age or you know other kind of you know inclusivity and, and, and diversity within the workplace being an issue, we are seeing around 25% uh, of the workforce within data engineering are female, which obviously means that the other 75% are, you know, are male. Again, many reasons why as to why that could be. Could that be, like I said, diversity and inclusivity? Um, could that be kind of a like a location area? Could it be a more, you know, is tech itself uh, like a, a problem that I need to look at internally or likewise within the public sector? Um, it's many many questions that we could ask around they'd be interested to hear your thoughts as to why you think you know the the, the industry itself is is you know incredibly male dominated because as we know we, especially in 2024 we, it is more about kind of having that diverse workplace a lot of people nowadays especially in the younger kind of generation that gen z um you know are looking for places that kind of have that diversity and inclusivity as a as a massive kind of you know and driving force within their organization so it's very interesting to see about that and of course you know median tenure of data engineering professionals before they kind of want to move on to a new role we're looking about one uh, 18 months a year and a half um and you know and that can be for many reasons that could be due to contracts expiring perm roles not kind of living up to the expectation um you know like i said earlier you know there is a still contractor roles are still kind of needed for these short-term projects um ranging from three months six months up to 18 months uh so you know it is very interesting to see kind of why that is only a year and a half um and a lot of people i've spoken to within the public sector not just within data engineering but data across the whole function you know some of them do kind of hop around jobs and there's nothing wrong with that to an extent however a lot of them do kind of put a lot of time not just specifically within a role but within the public sector they are like a public sector they hop around within the public sector whether that be to multiple kind of government departments local councils nhs foundation trusts um the people who kind of work within higher education tend to stay within higher education um purely because they understand the system and why that works and how it works and the way it does um but yeah we're, we're going to get kind of delve straight in to kind of the next page of, of, of this report to kind of look at the key trends um so you know is there a return to office from what we've seen um you know a lot of public sector organizations are kind of looking to you know increase the office time uh, a lot of kind of clients i've spoken to are looking at around you know 60 percent of the week so three days of the working week in office uh, i know a few of the roles that i'm currently working are kind of pushing that three days four days and still call it hybrid. I mean, do we call that hybrid or are we just calling that three days a week? Um, interested to know your thoughts. Um, you know, but that does, you know, effectively what that does is it, it does cut off a lot, large part of the market. Um, what we know, what we've spoken to, you know, and now from when we've spoken to, to candidates regarding this, um, candidates who have come from a, a, you know, a hybrid working environment where they can choose what days they come in if they do at least two days a week, um they're kind of being more put off roles that have you know minimum expectation of three four days a week um obviously the covid effect uh, with, with the remote working is obviously uh, probably a large part to do with that personally speaking i'm a big fan of working from home uh, i'd endorse it obviously if, if i had my own you know if i have my own agency I, I, i'd obviously endorse working from home um if you're good enough you can do the job wherever as long as the work gets done um however obviously there is the other side to that i do appreciate working with my team in office um, we all make the effort to come in five days a week, even though we've got the option to work from home. Um, only if necessary do we actually work from home, but very rarely do, to, do any of us work from home. Um, obviously, being able to collaborate and be with your own teammates and being able to just, instead of you know being a team's call away, you're literally just a, you know less than five metres away from someone who could potentially help you with work in a lot quicker, you know, in a lot quicker time than waiting for someone to call you back or if they're in a meeting. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a catch only do. There's kind of both sides of the coin kind of give relevant points. Um, but what we do find ultimately is that fully remote roles tend to attract the, the high caliber of, of candidates. Um, you know, previously, you know, 
we're finding that a lot of organizations preferred someone who would come from a public sector background um you know but with, with the broader tech stack that we find in other kind of sectors um a lot of clients are finding that bringing people in who've got kind of that bit extra about them from working in the private sector you know like we like we can see with kind of digital transformations Organize, organizations are kind of looking to adapt uh, new languages and agile methodologies and, and obviously that you know sometimes it has to come from an outside source from outside the public sector um, so they're kind of not relaxing isn't the word I'd use but they're definitely being more open-minded towards uh, people who haven't had public sector experience before um, as long as they can bring something to the table and, and nine times out of ten they more than likely can um a hundred percent i'll endorse anything that gives more candidates a chance to try out the public sector because like i said even though it has, has its own kind of you know pitfalls and, and has its own kind of uh kind of setbacks it is definitely a, a very a very much a very plentiful place to work and has its own benefits definitely um what we're seeing is there's been a notable shift from kind of the outdated programming languages um what we're finding is that candidates who you've kind of got the more advanced and uh kind of program languages um python especially at the moment is very much in demand sql is obviously very much up there as well but those who can kind of come in and command both python and sql that they can command very much a higher salary and they're very much more in demand um a lot of people can do one or the other uh but what we do know is that at the end of the day, I think with 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 kind of coming with Python, you've got a, a great chance of, of kind of standing out more from the crowd. Um, plus, an, another beautiful fact about the public sector is that you know their organisations are so keen to you know uh, upgrade and upskill their their departments and their workers. You know, being able to provide the training, you know, where the salary might not be a hundred percent, you know, you know, as expected. Um, one hundred percent, we've seen them being offered, you know, the extra training, the extra development. Um, to help them become a, mel a more well-rounded data individual um, and from my experience you know I've worked in places in the past where they've you know provided training where I've not been 100% and this is just outside of recruitment um, you know I've been able they've been able to provide training and it's definitely made you know, the workplace much more enjoyable when you know that you've got the support there and working in the public sector very much mirrors that um, there, you know, organisations are very much receptive to hiring candidates whom they can kind of further train, um, and you know that ultimately leads to more kind of candidate kind of job satisfaction, which obviously it results into greater job retention. Um, so, I mean, that, that's some great key trends that we've got there from the public sector. But where are you all located? I asked this at the start, but I think we've got a pretty good idea um, according to LinkedIn. So. You know, as, as expected, with, with the majority of public sector organisations either having their head offices based within the capital or, you know, offices within London, especially London takes a top spot. 100 percent London takes a top spot. Um, I think it's, it's roughly between 527 to 530 uh, uh, data engineers based within the capital alone. Uh, again, that's that's not exactly unexpected. But what we do find is that if we're kind of breaching out of, of, of London, you know, 100 percent, we can see you know, a place like Bristol, Birmingham. And, and kind of in northern powerhouses like Manchester and Leeds, uh, where these kind of these data hubs and these tech hubs are kind of sprouting out. I know a lot of uh, government organisations have offices based in Bristol or based in the north of England, near Manchester, near Leeds. Um, so that definitely provides a, a massive opportunity to those in the northern part of the country and in the Midlands, of course, with Birmingham with 63 professionals, um, where, you know, there's a traditional north-south divide um, in terms of work and in opportunities and and the state of living. Where we're able to, where the public sector comes in, you know, really well is able to provide opportunities to those who are further up the country and not within the affluent areas of London um, and Bristol, um, Manchester, obviously Leeds, especially you know, growing metropolises in the north and you know, with with, with the kind of ever evolving technology uh, kind of sprouting up in the north um, definitely gives an opportunity to a lot more people than what was previously kind of a very much a London dominated environment. Um, you know, many, like I said, many uh, public sector offices are, are kind of spread around the country. So it definitely opens up a lot more of an opportunity to work within the uh, data engineering uh, space. So, I mean, that was all great, but let's, we're going to try and move on a little bit more onto kind of who are the top employers. Uh, like I said, we'd be covering kind of who's investing more into the data engineering function. Uh, again, this all comes from LinkedIn. Um, thanks to the marketing team for kind of pulling up all this data together. It's great to see. Um, so as you can see there in the top spot, we've got the NHS. Um, no real surprise. I think NHS, you know, that Pounds Foundation Trust, 
you know, uh, services such as the ambulance services, whether that's a bit more internal, like NHS England, the BSA, digital, um, you know, 114 professionals are you know, based within the NHS. Uh, and what we're seeing is, you know, across the country, there are multiple of EPR projects undergoing at the moment. I think the last NHS trust to get their kind of EPR, EPR um, project on uh, green lit was only a few months ago. So, you know, that there's a massive potential across the country for short term project work for contractors and then long term once the project's completed, that long term need for, for kind of perm, uh, data engineers to kind of take over and lead the, the kind of function there. Um, similarly, across the kind of Office for National Statistics and, and Civil Service working with, uh, you know, a multitude of data and loads of data sets and data sources. Um, there's obviously a need for, for data engineers to keep everything ticking over, you know, make sure everything's kept in, in, in the best condition possible. Um, obviously, the, the central government is, is kind of a broad term for lots of little departments. Well, I say little, they are nationwide, but, um, you know, with things like the Department of Education who, uh, who are investing heavily within data, uh, Ministry of Justice, DWP Digital, of course, as well, are one of the main contenders within that. Um, TfL obviously have lots of data teams spread across uh, across London with loads of little projects going on. So there's always something going on with TfL, and obviously um, within kind of I'd say the last spot, one of the one of the smaller kind of big investors in the in the data engineering function is Met Police. Um, obviously, they they're always needed the amount of data coming in from statistics, whether it be crime statistics or just kind of real world statistics within the within kind of within the metropolitan area. Um, there's obviously a need to kind of keep all that data, maintain the data, kind of make sure everything's working smoothly as possible uh so look those are the massive you know big players within the data engineering function we're going to move on to the benefits um now i know like i said the salary within the public sector doesn't always match up to standard you know i, I spoke to countless of candidates who you've gone around yeah the role's amazing great opportunity but you know the salary just isn't isn't hitting all the right spaces so we, we need to kind of look at what the other reasons are around that to you know make sure that we're offering them a, a more lucrative role um obviously working in the public sector alone you know definitely has its uh its upshots you know where we've got you know giving back to a community or helping people in need or whether you're kind of changing people's lives on the daily um you know that's one side of it but things like as you can see healthcare being one of the main kind of benefits that we get dental shares you know gym memberships and things like that um i know that you know within the working within the central government or kind of you know within local councils especially pension contributions are as high as 28 percent, which is crazy compared to you know private sector i mean i'm sure if anyone watching is from the private sector you know maybe take a look at your own kind of pension contribution and see how that stacks up to 28 percent um I, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised um as to what you could be earning it will put in a way in terms of you know a pension but looking forwards um i think it's more important that to a lot of people you know that we're able to kind of provide that, that that flexible work in the compensation and the opportunities for growth um like we said earlier they're big they're very keen on on upskilling and developing their workforce um how that looks like for someone who's trying to get into the wonderful world of data engineering you know if you've been able to kind of come in with say like a with, with fresh off of university or trying to break into the industry and you know you can you can just learn and you can learn from some really really skilled people there's some really really good people in the uh in the public sector within data uh, as a whole uh, and the opportunity to kind of go under their wings and, and and learn from the very best um you know that that sort of opportunity is priceless and you know that does you know obviously improve your own skills develop you as a more well-rounded data individual and you know the opportunities for later career growth and later career plans as you've kind of undertaken some really good development there you know your career path really opens up and obviously leads to a you know a lot more you know, job satisfaction knowing that you're making a real impact but um as you can see there like i covered flexible working arrangements being able to work from home being able to come to the office if you want you know a lot of organizations they're not run by psychopaths they understand people have to work from home for, for, for a reason sometimes um despite the 30 the 60 percent uh working from home um you know then like they're not evil they're not cold-hearted they do you know if the opportunity to work from home is there then obviously you know they, they will let that happen 
salary compensation again you know the the, the contributions you get the pension you know the, the annual leave and all that sort of stuff it, it is massive there for them and obviously opportunities for growth we've spoken about the training and the upskilling um so if we're going to kind of move on and, and we're, we're almost coming towards the end of, of this wonderful uh talent and salary report but we're going to look at hybrid working as a whole uh like we said earlier covid had a massive impact on, on people's ability to work in office people were told to work from home remotely um and and you know some people have kind of gotten used to that there's some people who are working remotely completely before that who, who are stuck in you know what stuck in their ways isn't exactly the greatest way to say it but you know they're very keen to stay within that sort of remote working but you know if we're looking at the actual stats you know um we can kind of look at kind of our data engineering professionals off of flexi time you know our, our data engineering professionals off of remote working and, and both of those come with a majority to the yes um which often shows you know that, that these public sector organizations are more keen to you know be able to be a bit more flexible because they understand that sometimes the salary and other things don't quite match up to private sector so if they can offer you know remote working or you know flexi time or you know hybrid working or you know flexible kind of life with, with, within work then that does attract you know, a lot more talent to, to the to the table so that is really good to see we really love to see that these uh, public sector organizations are kind of trying to be more dynamic in the way they can attract top talent so it's very very i'll be very keen to hear you know from your perspectives you know what you can what you what you're offered from your employers are you allowed to work from home whenever you want or a set do you have set days you have to be in are you in all the time it's great to kind of hear more about that uh so if we're going to kind of move just a little bit further down obviously we can see how many days to kind of data engineers do remotely um and obviously the, the average we're seeing is between two and, and, and four days a week maybe three um which is obviously is 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 very good to see um the fact that public sector employers are keen to kind of place trust into their employers into their workforce to work from home and get the work done it, it is vital i think that shows that a lot of public sector organizations are keen to to, to you know make sure that, that they can get the work done and, and like i said the work gets done in the end that's the main thing that's what everyone cares about at the end of the day so some people even manage to get away working fully remote <laughs> trust me i wish that was the case sometimes but um look we're we're, we're, we're coming towards the end of this now and um, I, I'm genuinely very thankful to, you know, uh, the marketing team who put this all together. You know, they've done a great job. And um, as we kind of move on to the salary guide, um, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of, of, of these sort of roles are coming in with slightly below market rate. Um, data engineers between 40 and 50, 45 and 50,000. These are just some of the roles that we've placed on a, on a regular basis um, or are more common roles that we place across the public sector. Um, obviously these vary by you know five, ten thousand, but what we're seeing is there's a lot of emphasis on that, on that permanent role. Um that, that obviously at the moment, obviously the demand is still there for contractors, but as projects finish and as kind of public finances tighten a little bit, especially in the uh situation we're in now, what we're finding is, is that you know contractors will start to slowly kind of be, you know, not no longer extended and, and offer permanent positions where they might not feel like it's the right move for them so what we're going to what we're seeing here is, is kind of the average salaries um, across the engineering and business intelligence front you know we, we've um, placed accounts of like data professionals bi professionals and and these are kind of the market rates that we see in It'd be interesting to know what you guys think does this kind of match up to what you're already on um more than happy to have that confidential discussion you know at, you know as and when you're ready but as you can see here you know towards you've got the ETL developers, your data warehouse engineers, your SQL developers, your database developers, all within that 40 to 50 grand max kind of bracket. Um, again, as different organizations have different salary brackets. Obviously, you know, within the private sector, definitely probably gonna be a little bit higher, but like we brought up earlier, the benefits that come with working within the public sector, the flexibility of working within the public sector really makes this package a lot more kind of lucrative than you think especially with the massive con uh, contributions or pensions that they can offer you know you're adding an easton extra 10 11 12 thousand pounds as an overall package which i think that when you know when will be you don't think about it now but in the future definitely going to be something you look back on and thank yourself for doing because you know with the way things are at the moment pensions are definitely kind of one of them be more going to be more crucial now than they ever were before and um, so you know 
th this is kind of what we're seeing as an average rate for, for these roles that we fill. Keen to kind of get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, by all means, be able to be free to reach out. And, and yeah, and like, like I said, you know, here we are. We're, we finally got to the end of this talent and salary guide. It's been absolutely great to, to kind of hear uh, and to discuss and, and to speak about, you know, what's going on in the wonderful world of data engineering across the public sector. Uh, keen to kind of get questions from yourself. Uh, if you've got questions now, I'm more than happy to kind of take some questions now. Um, you know, I'm, we, I've been doing data for, for a long time now. I'm very keen to, you know, share what knowledge I have. And obviously, the, any, I mean, anything that I haven't missed, I'm sure it will be in the, in the salary guide as well. If you're keen to kind of go into it a bit more, my LinkedIn's obviously there. Feel free to, to reach out and, and, and just drop me a message or a connection. More than happy to have discussions with yourself. Uh, I'm always around on LinkedIn. I think I live on LinkedIn at this point. So I'm more than happy to take any questions. Um, a recording of this will be available. So if you are interested in either listening to my monotone voice for the next 20, for another time, for another 25 minutes, feel free to reach out and I'll get that sorted for you. Um, look, I, I'm more than happy to have any conversation, obviously confidential, you know, it's taped between us. No one obviously gets kind of hurt from that. But look, I, I think we're probably going to we're gonna leave it here if we haven't got any questions. So I want to thank you all very much for, for coming along and, and listening to myself. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed and found something useful, even if it's just one little thing that you've taken away. You know, that's 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 good enough for me. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I look forward to, to doing another, hopefully another salary guide in the near future. Take care. Cheers.